Okay, very good. Here we are. We're at uh, Boston Pizza here in Saga Beach. It's nice to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, appreciate it very much. It's a snowy evening here in Wasaga. I don't know what she's doing in Toronto. We've got about uh, eight people online right now, and uh, people are joining as we go. And tonight uh, is a real estate focus uh, event. We're going to be talking uh, about a few different things. We've got a few different presenters. I'm going to be talking about how to grow your real estate. Uh, portfolio through creative mortgage financing. We've got uh, Jerry Hogenhout. Uh, he is somewhere here, and Jerry's going to be talking about uh, minimizing your taxes if you're uh, a real estate agent or a real estate investor. We also have uh, Jordan Green is with us. He's a lawyer, and he's going to be talking about things that your lawyer should have spoken to you about, but maybe haven't. And we're going to try and do all that in about an hour. And then we have some live music and a bit of an open mic situation tonight as well. Helen Stewart is here. This is Helen right over here. She's a wonderful uh, country artist, a fantastic musician. The music will be happening on the other side of the, um, of the venue here. Uh, and there'll be lots of opportunity for networking if you're, if you're uh, going to stay around, hopefully to enjoy some of the music. So uh, that is the plan for tonight. So the first thing that I want to address is um, why would you want to grow your real estate portfolio, right? I think that's an important question. We can't assume that that is something that you would want to do. So you know, whether you're a real estate, if you're a real estate agent, you would, you know, want to sell more properties because if that's how you make a living. It's, you know, good to sell more real estate. But uh, if you're a real estate investor, why would you want to invest in more properties? So I've actually got some sheets, which I have mixed feelings about passing around, but I will pass them around because, you know, they say that when you pass them around, then people are staring people are staring at the sheets instead of listening to you talk but you know um i i put it together so there you have it so um the first thing is is that there's there's a housing a housing shortage uh in our province especially there's a housing shortage and they need more skilled workers to help build these houses so what do they do is they're uh, bringing people in new immigrants. We've had uh, traditionally uh, a lot of immigration into Canada. And the plan is over the next three years is to bring in about a half a million people each year into Canada. And the majority of those people will land in Toronto. And from Toronto, they will either stay in Toronto or they will move to outlying areas. We all know that real estate is very expensive in cities like Toronto and Vancouver. So they are moving to smaller towns where real estate is more affordable. So we know that there's significant demand. And when they bring in these skilled trades, of course, we need even more houses. So definitely there's big demand and there's a big demand for affordable housing, right? So let's keep that in mind. Real estate is bricks and mortar. You can see it, you can touch it. You invest money into the stock market. I don't know where it's going. I don't. I'm. I have a business degree, but I'll tell you honestly, I'm not very comfortable. Um, I'm not going. I, I don't know. It's it's good to be diversified, whatever the case. But real estate is bricks and mortar. You can see it. And I'll tell you something else. Even though there's been a softening in the market and prices are down a bit, guess what? Rents are not down. And if you're if you own real estate, rental real estate and you're renting it out, the rents are as high as they ever were. And I'll tell you something, I doubt that they're going any lower. Okay? I doubt it. So so it's a good investment uh from that standpoint. Let's see if we got anybody else to let in on the Zoom. Okay. And um prices are down. Higher mortgage rates, true, is temporary. 
they're they're on the high side now. This is not going to last forever. You buy real estate; it's a long term investment, and um, the prices are down. Could it go lower? Yes, it's possible that it could go lower, but it's it's a long term investment, and there are deals to be had out there. There are definitely deals to be had out there. So, optimism. Guess what? There has was a drop in the last week uh, in fixed rates. In fixed rates, I think investors are feeling that we are near the end of the cycle and that uh, inflation is going to start coming down soon. And as a result, they're moving money into the bond market. And when they move money into bonds to get fixed returns on their money, what happens is the bond yields go down and so do mortgage rates. So long-term rates, five-year rates, many of our lenders have been announcing rate reduction. So there you see the chart there. You can see that on November the 7th, 10-year uh, yields were around 3.6-ish. And then now November the 14th. Oh, actually, let me bring these slides up for the, uh, for the good people who are on the, uh, on the Zoom. It's here somewhere. Okay, so there's what we talked about, folks, on the Zoom. You can see it there. Uh, there you see the bond yields going down. Okay, so now their 10-year yields are just above 3%. So they've gone down about a half a point. Here's some further optimism if you're looking at real estate. And I'm sure all the... There's a few real estate professionals here in the room. I'm sure you've heard these statistics and seen these statistics already. Uh, home sales rose this month for the first time in a while. Uh, so the Canadian Real Estate Association senior economist is saying that the slowdown is, uh, is winding up. Um, the data suggests this current downtain, downturn may be in the later stages. Can you guys on the Zoom see the screen okay? Hopefully you can. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so we've got uh, the RBC economists. We've got TD economists who are all talking about nearing the end of this downward cycle, okay? Because rates are quite high right now probably won't be the end of rate increases. We may see another rate increase. The Bank of Canada meets again early December. There could be further on, on, uh, on the variable rate, okay? But again, these, they're pretty high and it is uh, uh, likely a temporary thing. So now let's talk about, I wanna talk a little bit about where to buy real estate. Okay, and I know that doesn't really play directly into creative financing, but before I get into the creative financing, I want to talk about where to buy real estate. And simple, the simple answer, I'm, unfortunately not all of you can see the screen, but you've got the pages, hopefully, is the small towns where uh, growing towns cash flow better. Okay, and obviously if you're owning real estate, cash flow is important, but from a mortgage qualification standpoint, cash flow is crucial. It's funny, we talk, I talk to many borrowers, they think, well, let's see, my mortgage payment is, uh, you know, 2,500 a month, and my rent is 2,500 a month, so don't they just cancel out from a lender standpoint? No, they don't exactly, the lenders don't exactly look at it that way, but there are uh, some lenders that are more flexible, it's called uh, the way they offset the um, the income from the expenses, so or the expenses from the income. So uh, smaller towns, for the price you pay for the real estate, you have a much better cash flow. So that's important. Here's something that's that's great. I don't know if you guys have all heard this. I heard this a little while ago. I thought it was amazing, and I wanted to mention it again. Four out of ten, out of Canada's ten 
fastest growing towns between 2016 and 2021. Okay, the number one fastest growing town right here in all of Canada, 20% in terms of population growth. It's amazing right here in Wasaga Beach. You guys who are watching on Zoom next month, you got to come down here and see what's happening. Big things happening, a lot of development. Soon the beach is going to be uh, redeveloped. We have it. Yes, Annette, we have a question. Okay, so the question, the question, I'll just repeat the question, is, is uh, what does it mean that uh, small growing towns cash flow better? Okay, so what that means is, is that for the price of the real estate that you're buying, relative to the rents that you're going to earn. So let's say you buy a piece of real estate with 25% down, we pick a number, okay, and you rent it out. When I say it cash flows better, that means you are more likely to have a positive cash flow. The rent will exceed your expenses on the property if you go to outlying towns. In Toronto, the real estate prices are so high and the rents don't match up. You you are almost certain to have a negative cash flow in Toronto on a, a typical property. Not the case for smaller towns. So that helps you qualify for the mortgage. And then when you have that positive cash flow, then you can buy more properties if you want to, okay? All right, so let's talk about creative financing. First thing is I would suggest if you can qualify, if you have the equity in your home, is to get a HELOC. What's a HELOC? A HELOC is a home equity line of credit. That's something where you not only have the debt that you might have, like, but you might have room there and give you access to draw on it should you want to buy another property. You can take money out of your house. If you're approved for the home, uh, home equity line of credit, you can draw on it anytime. So you can go, you can look, you can shop. And when you see that property that you want to buy, you can write a check and have money available to you for your deposit or your down payment. Okay, obviously you should get pre-qualified before you go do any of that, but um, that's a great tool is your home equity line of credit. Okay, very important. Now, the next thing I says is multiple mortgage components uh, to track tax deductible expenses. So the other thing is a lot of the, the products that are available out there is you can set up different segments in the same mortgage or the same line of credit. And it's important sometimes to have different segments for tracking purposes and the bank will do this for you they'll they'll say this segment i'm borrowing money and it's going to be used for a down payment on a property okay and that's important because then jerry as jerry will tell you then you can see exactly how much tax or sorry how much interest you're paying on that money because that money is going to be tax deductible right because it's for an investment whereas if you draw money to renovate your kitchen, that's not tax deductible. Okay, so you could have multiple segments as part of your home equity line of credit. Okay, the other thing that a home equity line of credit is um, is can be very helpful for. If your mortgage is coming up for renewal, okay, if your mortgage is coming up for renewal, this scenario here, one of our lenders sent us a scenario in the last couple of weeks. And it's it's pretty cool because what it shows is if you had a mortgage for $450,000 and um, then, uh, okay, at the beginning and you paid it down for five years and then now you owe 384,000 after paying it down for five years. Okay, so it's, it was originally 25 year amortization. There's 20 years left. Your original rate was 2.99%. And now it's renewing and rates are higher. So in this scenario, it could be 5.44. So it's it's much higher. So what happens? It's like payment shock, right? All of a sudden, you're going like, oh my God, I was paying $2,127 a month. Now I'm paying $2,619. Okay. So it's it's like it's a real shock. 
Okay, so if if you if you switch it over or get a now you can get a, uh, a home equity line of credit instead, you can you can split the mortgage up. So in this case, you see that uh, of of the amount that was owing, right? We originally owed we owed three eighty four. So now they've got one hundred and fifty thousand in a regular mortgage to continue on that 20 year amortization. And you've got 234,000 is, um, is uh, gonna be set up as a, line, as a line of credit at prime plus a half, whatever that is. And, uh, and at a new 25 year amortization and it can drop your payment. So yes, you're not gonna pay off the mortgage as quickly, but it's going to free up cash flow, right? If, if cash flow is a concern, um, this can save a lot of people because I'll tell you when for a lot of people who rates renew out there uh, at higher rates they're they're going to be sh they're really going to be shocked they're really going to and some people are are already experiencing the shock because if they're on a variable rate and their rates have been creeping up and up I mean there's people who were paying like fifteen hundred dollars a month for a mortgage and now they're paying twenty five hundred like you know because of of rates going up so. Um, so uh, a line of credit is a very valuable tool uh, to manage ca your cash flow and also to give you access. If you have equity in your house and you want to invest, this is a way to, to access that equity. Okay. Questions? Stop. I'll pause for a moment. Yes. Dean, Gordon. Yeah. You, so the question was, if you're if you're refinancing, if you're taking equity out, you have to have the income to service that debt. And the answer is uh, yes, you do. But at the same time, if it's a rental property, and the rental income is going to uh, match or exceed your expenses on the property, then at least you know you're going to be uh, you're going to be covered. Because you definitely don't want to get into a situation where you know you're going to be uh, not being able to make your mortgage payments. So you you absolutely uh, must be be able to service the debt comfortably with either your employment income and or rental income from from properties. Okay. Okay. Any other questions so far? Okay. So let's let's move along. Do a little time check. Okay. Good. Um, so address, focus on, I say here, my suggestion is to focus on multi-unit, okay? So this could be a house with a basement apartment. It could be a house where you're creating a basement apartment. Uh, I've, I have a, um, uh, a, um, a client that I work with. He has an ability to go into a house and take a look at it and say, Okay, we we put a wall here, we put a door here, you know, with minimal outlay, turn a single family into a two unit property, turn a two unit property into a three unit property, and to to not only increase your income, but you're also creating a product that is a value because rents are so high, people can't afford the rent. So now if you take a if you take what was a single family home. And you can create two or three units out of it. Um, you know the the rent for each unit is going to be lower. It's going to address an important uh, problem that we have, which is a, which is affordable housing. Um, what are some of the other uh, approaches in order to to help get things done? Longer amortizations. Okay, longer amortizations. Right, I think we all know what we all know what that means. Longer amortization is a way to reduce your payment, help you qualify for more mortgage. Okay, if if you need it to do what you want to do, no stress test. We've all heard about the stress test. Remember the stress test that came out a few years ago. Everybody was talking about the stress test. The stress test was where if um, if you're uh, uh, applying for a mortgage, that we would assume a a rate. 2% higher than what you're actually paying. 2% and that reduces what you can qualify for. Okay? 
And we that's that's a, a federally regulated institutions are under that, but Ontario uh, provincially regulated institutions do not have to follow the stress test. So we have lenders to address different needs, different situation. Self-employed borrowers. Okay, we I talked a little bit about this last week. Self-employed borrowers, sometimes they could be doing very well in their business, but they don't look good on paper. They don't look good on paper because they're minimizing the taxes. They minimize the income they report tax purposes. And when they go to the bank, the first thing the bank says is, show me your tax returns. Tax returns don't always look good. So we have lenders that we deal with. They will not ask for tax returns at all. They'll look for, they'll work off the top line. They'll work from your revenue. They'll ask for uh, bank statements, commission statements. They want to see, you know, what's your what's your what's your gross income, and then they'll consider reasonable expenses for your profession. That's that's big business in the mortgage broker community, right? Is working with self-employed people because the banks, I believe, Jerry, would, I know would agree with me. They're they're basically in cahoots with CRA. They want to make sure you're paying the maximum taxes. Okay. It doesn't mean you can service the debt or you can't service the debt. So creative solutions. Underperforming real estate. There's real estate out there. Sometimes you buy it, there's properties available, vacant units. The property could be run down, needs work. You go to the bank, the bank says, oh, what's the income on the property? Well, it's vacant. Oh, okay. Well, there's no income, so you're not getting the mortgage. Right, there's lenders out there that look at it, say, "Okay, you you fix properties before, you know what you're doing, yeah, okay, fine." So we can we can see the picture, we can see that the market rents are are X or whatever they are, and that you know we're we're going to lend you the money because we believe you you know what you're doing and you're going to generate you're going to fix up the suites. Uh, improve the property and start generating income to service the debt. Don't quit your day job. So we have investors sometime, they buy multiple properties and they say, I'm making enough money from my properties that I can quit my job. Okay, fine. But if you want to buy any more real estate, lenders really like it when you have income from a source other than just the uh, other than just the rental income from the properties. But if you look at multi-unit, five plus units, the heat comes off you a little bit personally. You still have to have some back, some backbone, some net worth, but they won't turn you upside down and, and see the watch for the money to fall out, the change to fall out of your pockets. Okay, they're going to look more so with the performance of the property. And multifamily, five units and above, you can buy with as little as 15% down and amortizations up to 40 years. Okay, there's a new program that CMHC has come out with where if you meet certain criteria for affordability, so you're creating affordable housing, uh, accessibility, and also energy efficient, they will actually loan you up to 95% and amortizations up to 50 years. That's multifamily. Some of the other creative approaches, I'm sure the real, some of the real estate agents in the room have worked on these types of things before. Vendor take back mortgage, right? Where the seller is uh, providing some Financing or vendor take back. Oh, look there, he's uh, he's he's moving and shaking. There he goes. Okay, good. Um, vendor take back mortgage, right? So to help with the down payment. Okay. If you want to know more about vendor take back mortgages, talk talk to me after. Cash back mortgages. If you have the income to service the debt, if you don't have the down payment, you can get up to ninety five percent financing with the 3% cash back. So you really don't need that much cash to get in, but you do need to have the income to service the debt. 
contributory income. What is contributory income? That's when you have somebody in the house who isn't necessarily on the title, but they're living in the house. Maybe you have adult kids living in the house. They're working. We say to the lender, look, as an adult kid, we show his address. He's living in the house. Here's a pay stub. He's not on the title, but he's contributing to the rent. It's not an official lease or anything like that. So some lenders will look at that. Reverse mortgages, okay? Reverse mortgages, you have to be at least 55 years old. That's a mortgage where you don't have to make mortgage payments. So um, amazing thing about the reverse mortgage, you can actually buy up to a sixplex with a reverse mortgage. As long as you're living in it, you can buy a sixplex and two other single family homes as well. Not have to make any payments. So if you're looking at, if you're in that category and you want to enjoy the income from rental units, that is a possibility. Again, you have to be at least 55 years old to qualify for a reverse mortgage. Fire sale. Okay, not literally fire sale, but there's there's deals out there. I, I, I'm I part of a forum where mar mortgage brokers talk and help each other. And somebody was recently posting how they, uh, somebody bought a property and, the, uh, and they got a really good deal on it. And the appraisal came in $200,000 higher than the property, than what they paid for it. So, the, so this mortgage broker was like, are there any lenders out there where I can then, you know, get basically 100% financing, right? Think about it. If the, if the, if the, right? Because the lender, let's say the, uh, let's say the property appraises for a million and you paid 800,000 for it. And you said, uh, well, you go to the lender, you say, hey, the property is worth a million dollars. I need $800,000. Will you lend it to me? Well, they might lend it to you. Okay. Usually they want to see that you've got some skin in the game, okay, that you're actually putting some money out yourself, and they're definitely going to check to make sure that appraisal is 100% uh, is kosher. But, um, but, you know, there are deals to be had, and there's, and there's opportunities, okay? Uh, gifts and cosigners. A gift must come supposed to be coming from an immediate family member, co-signers can help out. This is another way to help mitigate, you know, these high prices uh, nowadays. You see a lot of, a lot of times families are helping out uh, other people to get things done. Um, you know, you can, you can look at different types of, of real estate. There's especially like commercial real estate has been hit very hard through COVID. So there's opportunities in commercial land, um, uh, builders looking to looking to build, um, rent to own, rent to own is another one, but you got to be careful with the rent to own. So somebody, let's say, doesn't have doesn't qualify for a mortgage today, and they say, but I want to buy this property, and um, so they'll make their regular payments plus a little bit extra that goes toward the down payment and the hopefully can execute on a purchase in two or three years. Okay. Um, so rent to own is another option. Blanket mortgages. Blanket mortgages is where if you have more than one property, you can put a mortgage and it can be secured by other properties in your portfolio that can help you to access money to make improvements to a property or buy additional property. Somebody in the somebody in the bar tonight. I, I won't say who. I think he's gone. I heard him talking. He's he wants to take equity out of his house to buy another property in the bar. Anyway, Annette, you can grab. Just kidding. She, Annette's a mortgage broker too, and she specializes in reverse mortgages. Okay, so to wrap up my uh, my presentation, I just put in a couple of quotes from. Uh, the first one, Robert Kiyosaki, real estate investing, even on a small scale, remains a tried and true means of building an individual's cash flow and wealth. Robert Kiyosaki, 90% of all millionaires become so through owning real estate, Andrew Carnegie. And this other quote is from a guy named David Grossman. He says, don't try and time the market. 
focus on value and long-term investing is a long-term proposition. So short-term fluctuations, up or down, you're trying to wait for the bottom to know when the bottom is, good luck, good luck, okay? And that is my presentation. So next up, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna just shut this stop share, see if there were any questions, no, okay, good. So I'm gonna bring on uh, Jerry Hoganhout to talk about minimizing your taxes if you're a real estate agent or a real estate investor. Jerry Hoganhout, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yeah. Before we get going, there's lots of food here. So maybe while I hand out some cards, if people would, if you don't mind, yeah. yeah. And um, keep in mind here. Jason, oh, I got to sit in front of this thing. Okay, sorry. Speak loud. Okay. Is that good, David? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> once again, David, thank you for inviting me to talk about. Uh, what has become my favorite subject, uh, talking to people about minimizing their tax. I should also mention, David, uh, you, 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 you hit on so many golden nuggets in your talk. I mean, uh, it was awesome. And especially the, uh, the one that really hit home is the immigration one. <clears throat> uh, it's a real foundation for what we're doing in Canadian Investment Services uh, as far as relying on the immigration to fuel the uh, rental market. Uh, we do a lot of multi-unit uh, rental. And uh, the fact that there are so many immigrants coming to this country, which is really a lot based on not only our immigration policies, but the fact that we have a huge national debt that uh, we have to uh, correlate to our GDP in Canada, which without getting into the whole deep details, involves immigrants coming in and spending their money. So. Uh, it's a it's a huge foundation for what we do in our company, uh, which again in our company we do investments and we do taxes. So I'm a public accountant, and tonight we're going to talk uh, about taxes and cross over a bit on the investment side. <clears throat> but again, I'm here to talk about my favorite topic, which is minimizing taxes, uh, and especially uh, I know there's some real estate agents in the crowd. And uh, you've been handed a, a gift, a gift from the tax gods with your PREC, P-R-E-C, Personal Real Estate Corp. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> when we talk about minimizing tax, uh, we're really, you know, the tax is based on our income. So we take a step back and we look, okay, so what's our income? Uh, and what can we do with it? How can we, you know, we lower our tax by either lowering our income <clears throat> or redirecting our income. So when we step back from the tax and we look at our income, we're really getting income from a bunch of sources, but really some main sources. One is our job, <clears throat> okay? So we're either working uh, and we either work for ourselves, which means we get a T4 from the company we, sorry, we're, we're either working for a job, which means we get a T4 from the job, or we work on our own. We're self-employed. And if we're self-employed, uh, we have the ability to what I call channel that income through uh, a taxable entity. And that's a real important concept, uh, certainly in my world, and for people to understand. And what I mean by that is we really have three types of entities that pay tax, a person, a corporation, and a trust. And forget about trusts. We're not getting into that. So keep it simple. We have two entities that pay tax, a person, and a corporation. And the key is, can we channel that income through a corporation? And does it make sense? Okay, because when we have a job, again, we go back to where's our income coming from. If we have a job, we get a T4. And there's not much I can do about that. You're gonna have a T4, it goes on your personal tax return. We can't redirect that income and hits your personal tax return. And Maybe there's some employment expenses you're able to deduct against your T4 income. Uh, and without that, we're really stuck with putting money into an RSP to reduce that income. And I'm not a big fan of RSPs. We can talk about that a little bit later too. So we don't really like that option. Most of the clients we deal with are self-employed, which means we have the ability to maneuver our income. Okay, so when we're self-employed, 
we we basically basically from a tax perspective we take our sales we take our revenues we deduct our expenses against it and we come up with net income <clears throat> and so obviously to reduce our taxes we want to reduce our net income we want to be able to reduce our net net income plus we want the ability to flow that income to either a corporation or trust again we're not going to talk about trust so the first thing is we always want to be able to reduce our income Okay, so, you know, we want to be able to deduct expenses against our self-employed income. <clears throat> and most expenses are pretty obvious. You know, you go to Staples, you buy some office supplies. Is that a business expense? Absolutely, it is. Sure it is. But then you get a whole bunch of expenses. And, well, geez, is that tax deductible or not? <clears throat> One of the keys that we always try to encourage is take a lot of the expenses that you need to make anyway. We all need to eat. We all need a car. and We all need a house. So take those expenses and make them as, as tax deductible as they can be, okay? And there's lots of provisions that uh, allow for that. So we certainly want to reduce that income. Uh, don't be afraid to take some audit risk, okay? I'm not encouraging it, but don't be afraid. And what I mean by that is the Income Tax Act <clears throat> is, the, you know, which governs everything we do as public accountants uh, is written Half of it is written in black and white, that it's very clear what we can and cannot do. <clears throat> the other half is written in gray, and it's very, uh, in, you know, can we do this? Well, maybe, you know, so it's interpretive. You know, can you deduct your car against your income if you're self-employed? Yes. How much? Well, so as soon as you get into the well, but, maybe, da, 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 we're into the interpretive. Okay, it is your right to push that. Okay, so what happens again, the income tax, half of it is black and white, very clear what we can and cannot do. Then we have the gray area of the tax act. Yes, you can do this. Yes, you can do that. And what, what, it, what I mean by interpretive is we get to interpret it one way and CRA has the opportunity to interpret it a different way. Now, so we might go, uh, hey, there's two cars in the driveway. Let's make one car 100% business and the other car personal. Let's take the more expensive car and make it tax deductible. So we're doing things to try to reduce that net net income. <clears throat> and, and, and we haven't broken any rules. Anything we do in the gray area, we're not breaking any rules. We're not doing anything illegal. We are just interpreting stuff a little more tax favorable for our clients. <clears throat> and what is the audit risk? Well, I mean, every time we file a tax return, we have uh, three years. They have three years to come back and revisit the tax return. So the way the process works is we file a tax return. We get a notice of assessment, which is really just their computer spitting out an acknowledgement that they've received the tax return. There is a date on that tax, on that notice of assessment. And they have three years to come back and challenge anything that's on that tax uh, return. Okay, and uh, that happens, you know, more than enough. But many people go past those three years. We never hear from CRA. And so that's what I mean when I say, don't be afraid to take a little bit of audit risk. Uh, because one, you may never get audited. You know, we never file a tax return thinking we'll never get audited. We always file a tax return thinking, okay, we might have to deal with CRA on this. We got to make sure that we can defend it. <clears throat> but many times, the three years go by and whatever we did on the tax return, they've never challenged and we've helped the client reduce their income, which then reduces their, their taxes. So uh, again, uh, it, it, you know, I find in the accounting profession, with all due respect to all my colleagues, I just find most accountants are not very creative and aggressive. Most accountants just, you go there, here's my stuff, you owe a whole bunch of money, see you later, see you next year. And I'm like, wow, what, you know, I, I, we as accountants, I mean, I have one client, you know, when, when I was talking to a colleague and he says, you know, we spent so many years in school to really understand the Income Tax Act. And then, you know, we go there, we're really just trying to com comply the rules of the Income Tax Act without being creative. So it, it's true. Most accountants are not creative. They're not there to save their clients money. They're there to comply to the Income Tax Act, file tax returns. Uh, and there's a big lack of creative trying to explain to the client, like what I've just explained to you about the income tax app. Take it, take some audit risk, reduce your taxes. Okay. 
anyway, so um, <clears throat> the other thing again is the flow of income. So again, we have our sales, <clears throat> whatever we do. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a lump in my throat. I do not have COVID, I've been checked every day. Don't worry, I'm not here spreading anything. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So what I mean with flow of income, <clears throat> so if you're self-employed, again, we have two main taxable entities that pay tax, a person and a corporation. And when I talk about that, think of your a person, we have four tax brackets, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. The corporation has a tax bracket of 12%. Okay, so certainly it has a more favorable tax bracket. <clears throat> so we always want to try to be able to channel that income that we earn through a corporation. And if we're just self-employed people, we have that ability. Uh, if you work for a company, you get a T4, you do not have that ability. The real estate world <clears throat> has kind of been in the middle. Uh, they've got the blessing in the past from CRA to be self-employed contractors, even though there's some question, you know, do you work for Royal LePage? Do you work for Remax? Uh, you know, are you an employee or are you self-employed? And fortunately, for all these years, <clears throat> real estate agents have been able to be deemed by the Income Tax Act to be self-employed. But they've never had the ability to channel their income through a corporation until recently. And as I say, that's a game changer. I don't know how many are real estate agents in here, but um, it's just a game changer for what we do as tax accountants, and not only tax accountants, but investment people, because there's so much we can do that'll talk about what we can do in corporations but the key is the whole thought process is to take your net income and flow it through a corporation now what happens then so as i mentioned think of a personal entity and a corporate entity on the personal side we have 20 percent 30 percent 40 percent and 50 percent tax brackets the corporate side we pay 12 <clears> percent <throat> so needless to say that makes more sense to channel your income through a corporation at 12 percent and then we can decide how much of that money comes from the corporation that we flow to the personal tax tax return. And that's really the whole, the whole trick and the key to it all is to start the flow of income through a corporation, have the ability to leave it there, pay the 12% and figure out how much you need to take out of the company for your personal expenses. If we do what I said before, take some of those expenses that we have to incur anyway, food, car, home and make them business expenses and have our corporations pay part of those expenses, we're saving a lot of money. We don't have to take as much out of the corporation uh, to put on our personal tax uh, return. And another thing that we have the ability when the income is flowing through a corporation first, we have the ability to what, what I call characterize the income that we take out. Okay, so the income flows through the corporation. We take money out of the corporation in our personal, uh, you know, for our personal use. We get to characterize that income. We get to decide what kind of income it is. Is it a dividend? Is it a management fee? Is it a management salary? Is it a wage? So all those things have different meanings from a tax point of view. And the two big ones are, <clears throat> well, the biggest one is a dividend. What is a dividend? A dividend is basically the, distribution of corporate income. So if you can follow me here, we flow the income through a corporation, we pay our 12%, we're left with 88 cent dollars in the corporation, and we call that retained earnings, whatever's left in the corporation. We then can pay from retained earnings dividends. Dividends are taxed cheaper on your personal tax return. We can take out about $40,000 of dividends from a corporation and pay no tax, no, no personal tax. Okay, we've already paid the corporate tax, but we pull out about $40,000 <clears> and say 42,000, which is 3,500 a month, basically tax-free personally. And that's a really powerful tool in our tax planning. Then what we can also do is we can also have our corporation pay a reasonable tax-free allowance from our corporation to ourselves personally for stuff like our car, our house, our office and home. Okay, so just using round numbers, if we 
said, well, I'm going to pay myself a thousand dollars for my car and a thousand dollars for my office and home. Now let's think of this. We flow our income through our corporation. We pay ourselves a $42,000 dividend, which is basically tax-free. We take out $1,000 a month for our car. If it's reasonable, it's tax-free to us, tax-deductible to corp. Same with the office and home. If it's reasonable, tax-free to us, tax-deductible to the corp. So now we're taking out 5,500 a month, which is what times 12, I don't have my calculator, 72 or something. We can take out $70,000 out of that corp tax free, personally. That's pretty cool. Okay. Because if we couldn't do that, if we put $70,000 on our personal tax return, we're paying $20,000, dollars $25,000. So there's huge savings for that, <clears throat> that um, it's still an exercise of what I call a cost benefit analysis. So when we introduce the concept of a corporation into anybody's life, we have to make sure the benefits exceed the cost. There's no point in spending $2,000 on a corporation to save $1,000 on personal tax. It makes no sense. It makes more sense to spend a thousand dollars on a corporation and save two thousand dollars of expense we always want to make sure your cost benefit is in your favor and in most cases it is uh and it's funny when they introduce these uh precs they're called personal real estate corps the real estate industry i'm hearing all this stuff that um well that only works if you make three hundred thousand dollars or four hundred thousand dollars and i'm just like i can't believe that i'm hearing all this stuff because it makes sense probably for most real estate agents. The, the ones that it really doesn't make sense for are the ones that are, you know, miss selling two houses a year. Okay, you know, if you're a part-time real estate agent, yeah, it probably doesn't work. But if you're, you know, in the business full time, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And the other thing they I never heard anybody talk about, surprisingly, was Canada pension. Okay, so why does Canada pension apply to what I'm talking about? Because if you your income can flow to a corp, and if you pay yourself a dividend, you do not pay any Canada pension. Okay, now is that good or bad? Should I, shouldn't I? Well, I mean, if you earned $50,000 of income, not through a corp, so before corporations, if you had your sales minus expenses equals net income, if that was fifty thousand dollars that goes on your personal tax return, you're paying about six or seven thousand dollars of Canada pension. If you do it, blow the income through a corp, pay yourself a dividend, you pay zero Canada pension. So there's a savings of six or seven thousand dollars right off the hop. Now, is that something we should do? Maybe, certainly worth discussing. The Canada pension plan, I don't know if I can say this, it is the biggest ripoff out there. The biggest, the biggest. Okay, here's why. And uh, I, it hit home to me recently when I had a friend of mine who passed away at 64. Okay, so Canada Pension is designed as a system that you put money in, and depending on how much money you put in in your lifetime will, will determine how much you get. And you can start collecting at 60 at a, at a reduced rate. Most people collect it at 65. Now, this is money that has been taken off your paycheck. This is your money that they put into your very own Canada pension account. Yes. Okay, five minutes. Okay, so this is money they've taken off your paycheck, put into your very own Canada pension plan. So what happened with my friend, he passed away at 64. He was a hardworking guy, HVAC, so he's construction started at 18, <clears throat> died at 64, never collected a penny of Canada pension that they took off his paycheck throughout his whole life. And when we do the calculations of how much money that should be, it's well over a million dollars. And guess what happens when he dies? They take your money. They give you $2,500 and go, oh, so sorry, here's a death benefit of $2,500. So this friend of mine who died, I knew his son well, and he's like, Jerry, we got a check for $2,500. What's this? I go, that's your Canada pension death benefit. Where's the rest of the money? Like, well, they took it. And that's what they do. 
So Canada Pension is the biggest rip. It's criminal what they do. Okay, so I'm not paying any Canada Pension. <clears throat> and people are going to say, well, you know, you need, you need to make, you know, you need to have some money when you retire. Sure, great. <clears throat> you know, the thing's worth at least a million dollars. They're paying you $500 a month out of the Canada Pension Plan. Again, I repeat myself, it's the biggest ripoff out there. So when we talk about all this tax planning and using corporations and channeling your income through the corporation, one of the benefits we do have is the ability to not pay Canada Pension. Okay, and to me, that's a good thing. <clears throat> now, we always have to make sure, though, if you're not contributing to Canada Pension, you still have to supplement your income. We're going to retire one day, so don't worry about Canada Pension. Use that corporation. Those corporations are magic when we not only save tax, but in our world, we do a lot of uh, financial planning, retirement planning, estate planning. <clears throat> and the way I describe it is financial planning is more for today. Retirement planning is more for tomorrow. And estate planning is uh, the uh, the whole issue of passing your assets through your estate. These corporations are, are gold and, and, and allow us to do so much more when we deal with financial planning, retirement planning, and uh, estate planning. So they're certainly worth looking into. If you have the ability to channel your income through that corporation, you're going to save a lot of taxes. Um, so, and again, we want to make sure we use that 12% corporate tax rate to our advantage. We deal with tons of real estate investors. Um, we can hold a lot of the real estate investments in the corporations. Okay, the corporations become your retirement vehicle. In my world, I don't want any Canada pension. I don't want any RSPs. I want all any money I have in a corporation that we have a lot of control about how we take the money out and the tax rate that we take it out at. Can I wind this up, David? Or um, Yeah, please. Who's got some questions? Anybody want to <clears throat> ask some questions? I don't know. How do we tell if there's any questions? Sorry? Will I be our accounts? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes, I do. Yes, of course I can. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. If you teach me how to sing. Okay? Because I can't sing. Yes. And you're, no, I'm serious. I, I want to sing. I can't sing. But she, she, this, this lady has a gift. Oh, my God. Yeah, good question. The question is, what dollar income <clears throat> should you, uh, you know, should you be making in order for a corporation to work? <clears throat> tax bracket one. So I'm back on the personal tax return. We have 20%, 30%, 40%, and 50%. Tax bracket one is basically zero to $50,000. <clears> okay. So if your net income, gross sales minus expenses equals net income, if that goes on your personal tax return at tax bracket one, okay, spending the money on a corporation becomes iffy. Okay, so the one thing that we would add to that conversation is, do you want to pay Canada pension? Because if you earn 50,000 of net income without a corporation, it goes on your personal tax return, you're paying six, $7,000 of Canada pension. If you channel that income through a corporation, and took out a $50,000 dividend, your Canada pension is zero. Okay, so it's not a, a, it's not as black and white of an answer as it is. So a lot of it depends on, hey, do you want to contribute to Canada pension or not? Sorry? Well, it's it's not even a tax. It's a, it's a, con a, a contribution that they take from you to put into your Canada pension plan and when you decide to leave this earth, they just grab it and take it. It's criminal. Criminal. Oh, my God. I can't even go on about how criminal that is. But anyway. So does that answer your question? So it's kind of like, uh, you know, I'm using my lawyer uh, thing about, well, you know, maybe, you know. But certainly if you're higher than a $50,000 income, <clears throat> if you have the ability to channel that uh, income to a corporation, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, it makes sense to incorporate. And that's just, again, the advantage there we're talking about is the tax. There's so many other advantages when we talk about investing. Um, you know, all the things that David was talking about, multi-unit. Uh, we do a lot of investing inside of corporations, uh, and there's all kinds of reasons why that's an added benefit. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Yeah, so the question is, is there a survivor component to Canada pension? Yes, it is. So uh, if you pass first, there will be a survivor benefit. Uh, depending on a few things, but nine times out of 10, the, it would qualify for the survivor benefit. But there are certain things that happen that prevent a survivor benefit. But in most cases, you will qualify for that survivor benefit. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I don't even want to talk about the amount of money you get paid out of Canada pension from age 65 to let's say 95 compared to how much money is in your Canada pension. That's a whole other criminal act. That's oh my God. Anyway, it goes on and on. Yes. I did. I did. I did. Okay, so Dave, Dave, David is uh, David is suggesting that I'm telling people to be aggressive. I don't think I said that. I I, I think I suggested it's, it's okay. We're gonna we're gonna have to wind we're gonna have to wind this back. I think I suggested that you might want to consider taking a little more audit risk, okay, which is a little more different than aggressive. Now, here's the way I'm as aggressive as you need me to be with, within the law, okay? We don't break the law. We don't break the rules. It's not up to me how aggressive or how much audit risk somebody should take. It's up to you. It's up to me to explain what we can do, how far we can go, what are the audit risks, what do you want to do? So it's not up to me, it's up to you, but my job is really to explain how all this works. Now, what is the audit risk? Okay, again, as I say, whatever we do in a personal tax return or a corporate tax return, we send it to CRA, they spit out a notice of assessment that has a date on it. They have three years, personal or corporate, to come back and have a look. Okay, so now we get we go through an audit and let's say they don't like anything we did they will reassess your tax return okay you get a notice of reassessment and it'll have an amount on it that you owe okay and i'll remind you that if that happens we'll have had this discussion when we were filing the tax returns that hey they might come back to you and reassess your tax return and you may owe all the taxes that we've tried to save you that is reality and that might happen. <clears throat> so in the worst case scenario, <clears throat> if we're being a little, I don't wanna say aggressive, but willing to take some audit risk, uh, they're gonna come back and make you pay the tax that you would have paid anyway. And the little added component will be install, uh, interest. So the biggest risk is your little tiny bit of interest, it's not big, okay? So it's really, there's not much downside to taking a little bit of audit risk and trying to reduce our tax bill. Uh, and now if they do a notice of reassessment, we can fight it. We can appeal it. Okay, so we file a notice of objection. So now we get to kind of convince the area, hey, we don't agree with what you did. We think we're right because of all these reasons. And so that's a notice of objection. And we have the ability to do that. We have the ability to take that even further to the tax courts. Okay, we can go to the tax court. We can have, go through an informal process at the tax court. We can go through a formal process at the tax court. We can escalate it higher. We can go to the Supreme Court. And there have been tax cases that have gone to the Supreme Court. And CRA, the buggers that they are, if somebody takes it all the way to the Supreme Court and the taxpayer wins, CRA changes the tax laws. We've seen it on a number of occasions. So CRA doesn't like losing. If they do lose, they usually go and change the tax law that allowed that taxpayer to win. So anyway, uh, I think you're giving yeah. me the act. Yeah. All right, okay. Thank you very much. I'm gonna hang around. Uh, I'm glad to answer some more questions. Thank you. Great job, Jerry Hogenhout. Uh, let's give it up one more time for Jerry. All right. Next up, we have uh, Jordan Green. He's a lawyer. He's based in Richmond Hill. And um, he's uh, he's my go-to guy um, for mortgages. If people ask me who do I re refer um, for uh, assistance, he's a, he's approachable, accessible, 
quick uh, and sensible, no big stories. Uh, it just, uh, you know, common sense and to the point. So, Jordan, are you still here? Of course. Um, All right. Okay. So let me just um, put you on the screen. Give me to talk all that. Bring me front and center. Yeah, I'm going to um, make sure people can hear you, hear you as well. Okay, go ahead. Great. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Oh, oh, yeah, everyone can hear me? Okay, great. Um, so, David, thank you for having me. Jerry, it was nice to hear you chat about audit risk. Uh, sorry that I couldn't be there today. I might have been a little overly cautious with the first snowstorm here. Um, but anyways, I, I'll try and keep it brief about some of the things that we're going to discuss today. So, I have a bit of a tongue-in-cheek uh, presentation today and the things your lawyer should have told you. So before we get started, I just want to give you the standard disclaimer. So I am a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. Anything I discuss today, it's not legal advice. Don't take an action or refrain from taking an action based on it. You know, by its very nature, legal issues are complex and factually determinative. So if you have a legal issue, you know, for you, a friend, a neighbor, you know, please call or email me. Uh, it's jgreen at greatertorontolawyer.com or 647-478-8966. Uh, I can usually either help you personally or point you in the right direction. So a little bit about me. I graduated law school back in, 20, in 2009, worked as a researcher on, for the textbook on Canadian corporate law. Immediately can you, can you speak law. a little, speak, speak slower? A little Sorry, bit, is it coming a little? Okay. Is this a little better? Yeah. Okay. So immediately after law school, I moved to Manhattan to focus on uh, complex high profile litigation. And since 2011, I've been running my own practice in Richmond Hill, you know, focusing on real estate, wills, estates, and other corporate matters. Uh, often I get complex matters that have retained, been retained, referred to me by other lawyers, and I'm, I've been called to testify in court on matters of real estate. Anything that we do, I like to say, let's try and make it common sense. You know, you might not know the law from day one, but I should be able to explain it to you in a way that makes sense so that you know what's going on and how you want to proceed. Um, before we start any presentation, I like to start with a joke. And the first joke that I usually tell is the first one I heard when I got to law school on day one. And that's, you know, what do lawyers produce? So has anyone heard this? Does anyone have any input on what lawyers produce? What is it? What do they produce? Is that what you said? Yes. What What do we produce? What do lawyers produce? Bills. <laughs> that, that's a common one. Uh, so I don't know if anyone else is shouting it out, but hopefully you are. Lord of Lord of Any other guesses? No. Okay. We people want to know what do they, they want to know? We produce paper. So we yeah. produce paper. You come into my office, you see how many reams we get delivered every week. But as lawyers, we produce paper. Um, today, I was initially going to talk about private mortgage lending, you know, the benefits to lenders and borrowers, you know, the riches that can be made and the risks that uh, borrowers and lenders face. But instead, I think I'm going to focus on something that I've been seeing pick up recently. And it's, you know, simply what happens when someone can't pay their mortgage. So we often hear the line, I can't pay my mortgage anymore. Um, when I hear that, you know, what comes to mind is the view of the sheriff showing up and forcibly removing people from their home, or, you know, maybe it's back in 2008 in the U.S., our neighbors to the south, where entire neighborhoods were foreclosed on. I don't know how many of you have started to notice these situations or have had friends or neighbors or clients call them that they're concerned that they can't pay the mortgage anymore. And I don't know if any of you one here has experienced buying a property under a power of sale or under a foreclosure. Um, you know, perhaps you've seen them advertised. I suspect it's about to pick up. The reason for that is usually banks will wait a few months before they enforce. So let's say someone doesn't pay their mortgage back. You know, the bank will send out a notice. You know, first they call and say, hey, you missed the payment, is everything all right? Then they'll send a, you know, a scary registered letter. And then after that, they'll start calling the lawyers and you'll start getting the actual court process going. Um, 
So until that goes through, it's not going to be in the open, but give it a few months and we're going to start seeing a lot. I, I imagine we're going to start seeing a lot more uh, power of sales going through. So when we hear this, you know, powers of sale and foreclosures, foreclosure is usually the American beast. It's used interchangeably in Canada. If you're going to buy a property from a lender, it's almost always a power of sale. Foreclosure is when a lender takes over the property. So if someone forecloses on a property, they can't sell it, it's just theirs. Um, so a bank will almost rarely ever foreclose, but they will initiate a power of sale. So I'm gonna discuss first how a power of sale works and what you're gonna to wanna to consider before you put an offer in when you buy one. So in a power of sale, a mortgage lender is selling the property that they uh, have a mortgage on. So any mortgages that are subsequent to their loan are eliminated by virtue of the power of sale. Any debt that has priority isn't extinguished. So for example, if there's a second lender, they don't take off the first lender, it has to be paid off. Or if there's tax debt or utilities, that doesn't automatically get taken off by a power of sale. So if you're gonna buy a power of sale because it looks like a good opportunity or a fire sale, or it's a, good, like it's a great way to make some money, you're gonna wanna search the title before you do so, before you put your, power, your offer in. And you wanna know how much registered debt there is before you, not just after you, because after you, it's gonna get cleaned off. But before you, you wanna see if there's too much debt in front of the person who's selling the property, the sale will be in limbo until that's sorted out. So unless you're getting a really good deal, you might not want, want to have the litigation risk to sit well the lender and any people in front of you duke it out. You're also going to want to search tax and utility uh, certificates to see what's owing. You know, if you've ever bought a resale home before, and I understand there's a lot of real estate agents in here, so they see this on a, you know, on a daily basis, it's on the standard uh, form. They look similar. Powers of sale are often on the same form and they look similar, except the schedule A or B is gonna be a little different. Each lender is gonna have a different schedule A and B. And they could, and they're likely gonna disclaim some of these things that would be covered in a traditional purchase. So a lot of the diligence that you would do after signing agreement, make sure you do before you put your you know, pen to paper. Now, anyone here who has a friend, a family member, a neighbor, is facing demand for repayment from a bank, I mean, it's important that you act. Don't wait. It's, you know, you know, don't put your head in the sand. Don't let your neighbors and your friends do it. You know, speak to David about different financing options. Before you get to the power of sale, there's often a lot more you can do. Um, the further down that route you go, the worse your options are going to get. Um, Speak to David about financing and taking the power in your own hands. And then you can speak to me about legal steps that you might want to take to protect yourself. If you're a mortgage lender that, you know, you haven't been paid, you can speak to me about, when speak to David, maybe there's a way to refinance it and get you taken out on there and repaid. If not, you can speak to me and we can talk about what we need to do to, you know, light a match and get you repaid. Um, another topic that I've been seeing a lot more frequently, especially you guys are up there uh, in Lasaga, is where should your lawyer be located? A lawyer really can be located anywhere in the province, um, especially with COVID. I mean, I'm presenting to you today over video. Um, so any lawyer in Ontario who's real estate insured can act within the province. Even the land registry offices aren't localized anymore. So when we register something, you might be in York Region, you might be in Toronto, you could be in Sudbury. If that land registry office is busy, it just gets spit out to whatever land registry office uh, has uh, capacity. So there are differences within the regions, you know, between in Ottawa, the lawyer who's um, buying creates the deed as opposed to the seller. And usually, you know, further away from the GTA in Ottawa, the smaller uh, down payment we see, you know, I've seen down payments as much as, as low as two bucks or a hundred bucks. So, Usually when the Toronto guys come up to Sudbury or Sault Ste. Marie, they put in the big deposits. They, they don't need to. That's how you usually spot the guy that's not from around there. Um, but it's important that, you know, whatever lawyer you work with knows how to close a deal, familiar with the type of property. Uh, you know, is it residential? Is it a farm? Is it commercial? They're all different. Um, 
I'm familiar with these transactions. You know, I've closed residential and commercial properties from the Sioux to Ottawa, you know, from Sudbury to the GTA. So any lawyer you speak with, you know, I always say, one, do they know how to get the deal closed? And then two, do they pick up the phone when you call them? Um, and then the last thing that I'm going to try and talk about that I've seen more and more here is, do many people here have uh, tenants and properties? Or are they real estate investors? I can't see any if there's any hands or there's a speaker in front of me, but. So you did you just say does does anyone have questions? Is that what you said? No. Does, are there real estate investors? Are there any? Are there guys here or girls here that have properties that are tenanted? Are there real estate investors here? Real estate investors. <clears throat> Nobody's lifting lifting nope. their hand because uh -oh. they're not real estate investors or because they don't want to admit it. So. So, but go ahead and so you might hear what happens if you have a tenant in a property and you can't get them out. You know, but so just what happens? It yeah, people are want to hear about it. Right, you sell a property and you can't get the tenant out. What do you do? You know, the landlord tenant board's backed up, so obviously you would want to proceed through the landlord tenant board. But what do you do when you're going to wait six months or nine months? Um, the delays are only exasperated with COVID. And then even if you're the tenant's responsible. We have one suggestion. Um, Nadine suggested cash for keys. Can you pay that's them? That's exactly what I was going to say. So you can always, nothing prevents. Oh. Well, I think we're losing Nadine. People from negotiating a settlement together. Okay, we, we lost you for a second. Cash for keys. So nothing prevents someone from negotiating an exit. So usually if a tenant isn't paying, it's be, and you want them out, they have nowhere to go. If they can't afford to pay you one month's rent, they can't afford first and last month's rent somewhere else, and they can't afford a moving truck. So what's a reasonable settlement when someone won't leave is the offer to show up with the truck, and you offer to give them first and last month's rent somewhere else, and it's a fresh start for everyone. Uh, so Nadine had some suggestions with that as well. Was, were you going to say the same thing as me? Yeah, she was going to say the same thing. So, and when and when the new landlord calls you for a reference, what do you tell them? Beautiful tenant, stellar, never <laughs> missed a payment, right? I would say you always be honest and you can say, you know, we have a position. I don't like to, I don't give uh, references. You know, you never want to lie, but you, you be honest. You don't feel comfortable giving an honest reference to someone. You don't, don't do it. Or, you know, you say the nice thing. Um, and I mean, certainly we're going through interesting times right now. So just the last thing that I'll speak to, and it's a little difficult just because over the Zoom, but realtors.ca publishes their stats. And I mean, this is going to be interesting for all the real estate agents out there. Uh, you know, in the most recent publication, um, the decline in searches of its market. So, I mean, waterfront property, it's been 33% searches down. Uh, I'm in Richmond Hill, so I pay attention to, you know, single family residences. The search for those are down 66%. So, I mean, there's going to be opportunity to, to make money here. And there's also going to be, you know, a lot of people that need help as mortgage rates go up as they renew and as they have problems paying. Um, so I hope you found this interesting. It's intended to be of a general nature. If you have a question, you know, I'd really encourage you to call me or email me. I'm usually pretty good at either helping you or if I can't, pointing in the right direction. Okay, that was great, Jordan. People are clapping. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, definitely. And um, if you wouldn't mind, you could note your... Um... Uh, contact information in the comments uh, field for the people who are online and for anybody who's here. If you want Jordan's information, I've got it in my phone. So you can snap a photo of it, of, of his contact information, or it'll be on the screen. He'll type it there. So um, thanks everybody who attended here in the restaurant. Uh, Helen Stewart will be um, starting up some music shortly. I'll be playing some music tonight as well. And um, there'll be others too. Maybe if we twist uh, Kurt's arm, I don't know if he would consider singing. He's smiling, so that's a good sign. All right, for sure. And there, there may be others coming by as well. And um, 
Jerry, thanks for that presentation. That was great. Jordan, thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you to the people who were online as well. And um, we will see you next time. Next time, we won't wait so long before we do these. I might start doing them on a monthly basis. Not sure about December, but uh, certainly January. And um, uh, it's been fun. So yeah, Jordan, nice job. Thanks, everybody. See you later in, in Zoom. Good night. There you go. Jordan's phone number. So make, make a note of that or snap a photo of it if you like. Awesome. <clears throat> Good night, everyone. See you. Come on up to the bar. It's, uh, it's not too late here. Wasaga Beach, Boston Pizza. We'll be here till 11 or later. Bye for now. See ya. <laughs>